Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be discussing post-colonial modernism. You may remember towards the start of the semester, we looked at examples of colonial artwork. And that was artwork that was created by people who represented countries who were trying to colonize different parts of the world. Now, when we look at post-colonial modernism, we're looking at artwork that was created by the indigenous peoples of a country or their descendants as their country gained independence and tried to reclaim their social identity. So we're going to be looking at examples of that artwork here. But first, let's get into a definition of that a little bit more. So post-colonial studies is a field of academia that addresses the consequences of imperialism and colonialism. Post-colonial art is any art created after colonial rule ends in a country. The art draws inspiration from topics such as race, ethnicity, cultural identity, which may have been suppressed during colonial rule. And this art, as I said before, is created by the native people of a colonist country and their descendants. Now, where this can become a little bit confusing is when we think of what happened in the United States. So while we did have colonies in the United States, Great Britain established colonies, there were also people coming from other European countries to settle here. We wouldn't necessarily consider the art created by those people's descendants to be post-colonial art. And if you're wondering why that would be, since as I said, post-colonial art is art created after colonial rule ends in a country, we need to consider who is making the art. So someone who is of completely European descent would be someone whose ancestors benefited from that colonial rule in some way. So even though in the United States our colonists uh, rebelled against Great Britain and wanted their freedom and formed an independent country, they were still benefiting from systems that had been put in place by those Europeans. And this included things such as pushing the Native Americans off of their land in order to take over more territory. So again, even though they felt they were being oppressed by Great Britain, they were also part of an oppressive system themselves in that they were again pushing Native Americans off of their land and then kidnapping uh, people from Africa and bringing them to the United States uh, as slaves. So again, if you, someone benefited from this system of colonial rule, then their art that they create after independence isn't really post-colonial because they're still, again, benefiting from that system. But if we had uh, someone from another country whose uh, ancestors were from that country and they gain independence from Great Britain or from France, uh, from another country such as Spain later on, then those descendants could have post-colonial art as an expression of their cultural identity that they are trying to reestablish once they gain that freedom. So I hope that makes sense. I know it can be a little bit tricky since there are so many countries that have been colonized, but again, if the uh, ancestors were privileged because of colonial rule, then they don't have the same right to the post-colonial artwork as people who were very much oppressed and then had to reclaim that identity. Uh, and there's also, as I already noted here, a lot of inspiration coming from racial struggles, ethnicity, uh, trying to reclaim a cultural identity that was suppressed. And it's not to say that there was no artwork being created by these people during colonial rule. So uh, if your country was invaded, you would still need to have things such as uh, pottery, um, textiles, other things that do show creativity and are considered artwork, but they were very much for practical purposes as opposed to having, let's say, paintings or sculptures or other monuments to some one's own culture because the country that has come in that has invaded is trying to become the dominant culture in that area uh, as well as taking over economics and other areas that the that the original people of a country would want to have for themselves so again a lot of kind of layers to this here so we're going to look at a few different examples and then we're also getting into the overlap with modern art and modern art this period begins in about the 1860s and continues all the way into the 1970s Post-colonial art is technically created before and after this period because it just depends on when a country gained its independence, and post-colonial modernism refers to the overlap between the two genres, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Where is it created? Again, post-colonial art is created in countries that were controlled by countries such as uh, England, Spain, France, just some examples here. Post-colonial art can be found in other areas, though. We can find it in countries in North America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, so again, other uh, nationalities that had been in the uh, North America, South America area before colonialism took over, those uh, people can reassert their culture through their artwork. So again, people of European descent purely in North America aren't going to be coming up with post-colonial art, but uh, Native American peoples can create this post-colonial art. And then we have next here, imperialism is when a country tries to make itself stronger by taking territories from other nations. So kind of just grabbing land and territories. Usually these power-hungry countries have kingdoms. So we can think of, again, Great Britain, if you use this as an example, but there were, of course, other kingdoms in Europe, and there still are today. And imperialism is more closely associated with an invasion than colonialism is. So it's not just about, oh, I'm going to build a town here. It's about taking over land through force. 
So our first examples we're gonna look at here are examples of post-colonial art in the Middle East, and there'll be a video associated with this in our module as well. So the Ottoman Empire went into decline during World War I, and at this time, European countries took advantage of the dissolving empire and sought to acquire more territory in the Middle East. So they saw that there had been a struggle, that this empire was on its way out, and they thought now is the time why, while they're weakened to try and make a grab for this land. And then Britain was no longer a major power in the Middle East by the 1950s. So they tried to spread their empire, the British Empire, out that way. And then because of the wars, because of World War I and World War II, they couldn't really hold on to that. They had other things that they were dealing with. So our first artist we're going to look at here, Kayali, was born in Syria in 1934. And he was uh, previously an art professor, and then he, in his spare time, made uh, paintings, sketches, did a lot of different types of artwork. Syria unofficially became independent from France in 1936. The French military stayed there during World War II, though, and then the country officially became independent in 1946. And then Kayali died in 1978. So we'll look at a couple of his pieces here. So this first one is from 1960, and if you've watched uh, maybe some uh, television programs that are set in the 60s, the style of clothing the woman is wearing might seem somewhat familiar here. So we see that this is someone of the upper class. She's in a fancy chair. She has her hair done up. She's wearing a nice formal outfit here. So we have him showing a depiction of someone in the upper class. And the background, we don't have as much of the realism. We have kind of a generic plain background here so that we are focusing on the woman, on her makeup, her hair, her clothing, and she really becomes our focus. Now the use of color in the next two paintings here is going to be a little bit different so we can see still that background that isn't meant to draw our attention too much rather plain and we've got some more somber colors here for the woman's clothing a little bit of a more serious expression and then we'll go on to another one here also by Kiali. This one's called Motherhood. Again, that is somewhat plain background so that we're focusing on the woman. We can see that the style of clothing has changed a little bit. Uh, we have a child in her lap here. So showing in, in all of these really just normal scenes of life, just a basic portrait of someone, we may note that Kiali is alternating the eye contact from the subject. So I'll go back to the first one for a second here. So we have the woman who's looking fairly directly out at the audience. And the same with this one here, the portrait of a lady, the woman is looking at the viewer. And then here the mother is perhaps more concerned with her child. So varying the positioning of his subjects, so we're not seeing the same thing in every one. There are other artists who try to be more consistent, some will vary the positioning of their figures. So here we can say Kariali having his models in slightly different positions just for some variety here, because it would be kind of boring if we had everyone in the same position all the time. Next, we'll look at post-colonial art from India. So in the early 1800s, the UK sought to gain control of India. And the British rule of India lasted from 1858 to 1947, so really in the scheme of things quite recently. And part of trying to maintain this control and make themselves a presence in India was that the Queen uh, Victoria named herself Empress of India in 1876. So she wanted to be not just Queen, but Empress, and again, trying to reach out and grab more territory through doing this. After World War II, Britain realized its empire was changing. It couldn't really keep track of all of its territories. It had, of course, already lost the U.S. Uh, quite some time ago. So at this point, Britain starts to kind of rein things in and is no longer as focused on that empire building. So we're going to look here at some examples of art from Christian Kana. I really like this portrait of him. He looks quite happy here. Uh, Kana was born in 1925 in India, so while it was under imperial rule from Great Britain. Uh, and the city that he was born in is now uh, Faisalabad and is part of Pakistan. So there was a reorganization of, of land during his lifetime. He worked at a bank for 14 years, so he didn't originally set out to be an artist, but he really fell in love with artwork, quit his job, said, nope, no more of that, and became an artist full time. So I'm happy for him that he made that decision and, and could give his time to his artwork. So India and Pakistan were both kind of created. Of course, the land was already there, the people were already there, but their territorial lines were reestablished, and so they were kind of recreated on August 14th, 1947, when they gained independence from Great Britain and their boundaries were decided. And Kana is still alive today. He's 96 years old, still going strong. So this is one of his paintings here. And so news of Gandhiji's death is uh, could also be translated as news of Gandhi's death. That was painted in 1948. And the painting is depicting people of different religions reading about, learning about Gandhi's death. Gandhi had been a well-known supporter of India's struggle for independence. So this is our artist kind of paying tribute to Gandhi here. We can see that the people are of different genders. They're wearing different styles of clothing, but they're all interested. They're all kind of united in this reading of the news. And this is at a time when people would have been hearing about different events on the radio and things, but 
we didn't have uh, the internet then, so news didn't travel as fast. So reading things in the newspaper was still a way for people to gain knowledge and to be kind of in on the same world events. So again, we're seeing people united here as they all take the time to stop and read the news. So connected and yet alone as they're reading by themselves. We'll go on to another Kana piece here. So this one is called The Last Supper, and you've probably heard of The Last Supper before. I'll go next year to the one you've probably heard of before, so The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. We've got Jesus in the center and then his disciples to the side of him, and this is shortly before uh, Judas is going to betray him. So it's The Last Supper with the whole group together here. I'll flip back to Kana's interpretation. So again, same title roughly, so Last Supper, The Last Supper. And Kana is kind of reimagining that scene. So we still have a figure who is somewhat centered in white here, but we have a square table instead of a rectangular table. We have people who are facing some different directions. Their faces are not as clear here. So again, a reimagining of the scene. Uh, the people's ethnicity has been changed. The background of the room has been changed. And when we go between the two, what I want you to kind of think about is where your eyes go. So what draws in your focus? How do you interpret the scenes? Uh, what makes them different. There's, of course, a lot of differences, but how do these different interpretation, interpretations change how you would think of this story or this scene? And for some people, they like the square table here because everyone kind of has to face each other as opposed to kind of the awkwardness of the long table here. Having the long rectangular table lets the audience, lets the viewer a little bit more in on the scene because you can see everyone kind of straight on. This one, we have our the, the figures backs to the audience, um, but at the same time, it can make the scene seem more realistic. So just think about those similarities and differences as you go through the PowerPoint later on. We're going to move on now, though, to post-colonial art in Africa. So the British Empire had an increased interest in Africa after losing colonies such as those in the United States. So as I said, as time went by, the empire had a harder time keeping track of all its its territories. Of course, people wanted their independence back, so there would be wars, there would be skirmishes, and so they kind of changed their focus and want to take resources out of Africa. Countries that fell under British rule include Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, and Zanzibar. This is not the extensive list. This is just a few examples of countries you may be more familiar with. And some of the countries did not gain independence until the 1950s and 1960s. So again, really in the grand scheme of things much more recently, I think when we talk about colonialism, when we talk about gaining independence, we tend to think about the United States or we think about France and their different struggles for independence. And we kind of think of it as being a long time ago. But again, there were other countries that were still under colonial rule until the 1950s and 1960s. So independence is quite new for, for some people. So our artist we're going to look at here uh, first is Dumil Feni. Feni was born in 1942 in South Africa. His full name, I do not want to butchers, but I've put the full name here out of respect. And he worked in several different mediums. So really a craftsman uh, who tried to work with different mediums, different materials, and just kind of expand his abilities. South Africa became independent in 1961, so during his lifetime, but they still dealt with apartheid. So there was racial segregation that was legal from 1948 to 1994. So this would mean, uh, as we had in the U.S., that people could be separated on buses. There were rules against interracial marriage, and that, again, lasted until 1994. So there are plenty of people alive today who, if they grew up in South Africa, their parents may have been kept apart at times because of these rules. So really an awful thing. And then Fenny died in 1991, so he didn't get to see the end of that apartheid, but it definitely influenced his work, and we see that in some of our paintings here. So we'll look at a couple. So this one here is Fira from 1966, again by Dumil Fenny, and we see two figures here with their hands up, partially shielding their faces. And for some viewers, this can remind them of the struggles that we've had in the U.S., where we think of people saying, hands up, don't shoot, that there have been conflicts uh, between individuals and the police. We have issues with police brutality. And so this is reminiscent of that for many of us in a way to think of someone putting their hands up, trying to show innocence, trying to comply with uh, the demands of an officer. And so we see that happening here because that would have been something that someone could have encountered in South Africa at this time. We'll go on here to African Guernica. So this is another piece that's inspired by an older painting. So this is Fenny's version of that from 1967. And then we'll go on to the original for just a second here, Guernica by Picasso. So this is another one that you may have heard of before. Um, this is a painting that inspired Fenny's piece. And Picasso painted it after the town of Guernica was bombed during the Spanish Civil War. And so we can see a lot of kind of chaos in this scene. We see bodies in all different positions. We see some animals that may have been affected by the bombing. And so the chaos, even though it can be confusing to viewers, is also kind of bringing our attention to 
the idea of what happens after an explosion like that, that people are confused, it's chaotic, that if he had just painted a normal scene of people in the streets, it would have been a disservice to what was happening and to the violence of the Civil War. So I'll go back here for a second to the African Guernica, again by Fenny. So we see uh, some images that are similar to Picasso. So we still see some farm animals. We see people whose bodies are in different positions. So he's kind of trying to show the same kind of chaos that had been happening in Picasso's time is also happening to people who are in Africa. So he's kind of saying, this is our version of what you went through and connecting uh, what different cultural experiences have been like. All right, and then we'll go on here. So this piece is not by Fenny, but this is another piece of African post-colonial art. So this is an independence monument in Uganda. And Uganda gained independence in 1962. And this one's a little bit meta because we have the statue in front. And then if you look behind it at the mural, we can see that there's a painting of the statue. So again, a little bit meta. We've got a statue and then we've got a painting of a statue. And in the statue, we see what appears to be an adult whose legs are bound so bound by oppression, and then they are holding up a child. So the child's arm are, arms are upraised. The child is representing the freedom of the next generation there, so the hope for the future. Uh, if you look back at that mural, you can also see tanks. You can see uh, someone laying down in the background who's probably been killed in this struggle. So giving a, a callback, a reference to the past here, showing the struggle, but also, again, holding up the future. So turning this into a more optimistic image than if it was just showing death. So showing how even though the past generations were bound and we carry that with them, the younger generations, the next generation can be raised up and can put their arms up for freedom. All right, we'll go on here to post-colonial art in the Americas and Caribbean. So Great Britain had 11 territories in what was called the British West Indies. While some of these islands have gained independence, so Jamaica and Belize, for instance, others are still considered British territories. So we've got Turks and Caicos, Bermuda, and the Cayman Islands that fall under that category. Our artist we're going to look at last year is Barrington Watson. Watson was born in Jamaica in 1931. He was a well-known football player in high school, so he was, became really known for being an athlete. He went to study art in London, Paris, and Amsterdam, so really traveled the world. He was one of the co-founders of the Contemporary Jamaican Artists Association, so a cool thing there to start this group to really raise up other artists. Jamaica gained its independence in 1962, so he got to witness that, live through that, and then Watson died in 2016, so fairly recently. So this first piece here by Watson that we're going to look at is the more... Bay Rebellion. So this isn't a scene of an event that happened in Watson's life. This is a historical scene that he was depicting. And slavery was abolished in Jamaica in 1834, but they weren't independent yet. The country wasn't independent. So slavery was abolished, but there were still European influences there. And in, uh, in, sorry, in 1865, there was this rebellion. So what happened was there was a court case that had uh, garnered protesters, and uh, then the uh, martial law was put in place to kind of basically try and put down the protesters. It was, became very violent. Uh, hundreds of innocent people, as I noted here, of all ages were killed by the soldiers. So basically, martial law came in uh, as if the as if an army essentially needed to face these innocent civilians, and hundreds more would be beaten, arrested, and imprisoned, often without a trial. So these people were just trying to protest what was going on, that this, that this case was happening and things were being unfair, and their protests were met with this violence very much a miscarriage of justice happening here. And Jamaica did not gain independence until 1962. So again, Watson would be someone who knew the history of the island, knew about these different events, and in his own time was kind of echoing these injustices through his artwork. So kind of showing that, hey, we've gone through these periods of violence, of injustice, of people being treated just wrongly and violently. And so even though slavery was abolished, that didn't mean that everything was fixed. There were still issues that needed to be resolved. So he's kind of mirroring that through bringing up these scenes of history to show to people in his own time. All right, and then lastly, we'll get to this last painting by Barrington Watson. So this is Conversation. So we see three women who are in the working class. They've got their pails by their sides. They're cleaning the floors or something, but they've taken this break. They're having a talk and just kind of comparing their experiences here. So a good painting to just highlight the working class. And again, we've seen this progression through the different art we've looked at, that artists went from only painting people who were in the upper classes or who were royalty to painting people of other classes, of the middle class or the working class, and showing that everybody is worth being painted, that everyone should have uh, their lives reflected in artwork, that everyone has that beauty in just being human. And that brings us to the end of our post-colonial modern artwork PowerPoint here in lecture. 
This PowerPoint is also going to be available in the module for you if you want to refer back to it as you prepare for the final exam. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please let me know. Otherwise, we will wrap up our video there.